So uh, this is the weekly uh, West Florida HCA conference uh, today. And uh, the mystery case with Sherlock Holmes, all these are being posted at craniacarecritique.com same day. We also have cardio-oncology posted there, as well as videos from coronary anomalies. So uh, lots of videos there, plus the videos we originally made on teaching CT, MRI, and PET. We have our patient today who is younger than our usual patients. This is a 33-year-old lady who uh, moved to Tampa from Denver, and uh, she came to the emergency room here, and I saw her in 2013. She was having chest tightness and shortness of breath that she'd been having palpitations. Apparently she had a history of palpitations that went back uh, several years. She would feel her heart running away. It seemed to be uh, induced by exertion for the last minutes to hours and uh, she was having more of these episodes. They were happening uh, longer and more frequent accompanied by shortness of breath. She did have a history of some asthma in the past but this was different from that she also has some dizziness, diarrhea, hot and cold spells, and uh, she's a very nice lady. She has uh, two children, both boys, she's married, uh, and her husband is very pleasant. And so she denied any of the fever, chills, recent illness, weight loss, changes in appetite. And we have her past history, very interesting. I'll show you her past history where she's had some TIA stroke type events, times four, 2010, she passed out a couple times. This is interesting, left carotid vertebral artery dissection. I guess that's both. Abdominal aortic dissection. Wow. wow. That's amazing. Wow. I, I agree with you, Dr. Carroll. Recurrent palpitations, SVT alleged heart murmur, DVT, factor five light mutation, question mark, and, uh, and then some other stuff, asthma, pneumonia, ruptured left ear, 80% hearing loss, peptic ulcer disease, and thyroid nodules. So that's pretty interesting. And she had her ear was worked on and she had a tympanoplasty. She's had hospitalizations two visits in the last couple of months, one for acute right lower, lower quadrant abdominal pain, the other for acute chest pain. Imaging ruled out new dissections, aneurysms, pathology of major arteries, no pulmonary emboli or advanced cardiac, or, uh, uh, cardiac uh, insufficiency, acute coronary insufficiency. She has a history of her grandfather dying of a ruptured thoracic aortic aneurysm. Both grandmothers had atrial fibrillation. Her mother has some kind of irregular heartbeat. We're not sure. She's a non-smoker. She's been on Coumadin, Metoprolol, Ativan, Albuterol, and Aspirin. She's allergic to these medications, including Aspirin. Allergic to Aspirin and on Aspirin. Not sure what that means. And so she's had some exercise and chemical stress tests. She gets a super normal heart rate response. I'm not sure what that means unless we induce an arrhythmia when she has perhaps lexiscan or dobutamine or something. She's been advised because of her aneurysms and dissections not to exercise or lift weights. She's had a CT of the chest, abdomen, pelvis, MRI, non-dilated infrarenal aorta with dissection pararenal to right common iliac artery with filling in both true limit and false limit, no thrombus. Maximum diameter of the aorta 2.1. Said a CT of the brain with contrast, normal, no bleed, mass lesion or stroke. And this is interesting, she has moderate scoliosis of the thoracic spine, no acute abnormalities. Physical examination, we didn't put in her height. Her height is, she's 5'7". Uh, so 5'7". 
She blood pressure is normal. Temperature, respiratory rate, heart rate normal. She has a pectus in her chest X, on her chest. And uh, she was in a normal rhythm when we saw her. She wasn't going fast. But she'd come in because of a fast heart rate. Pulses were all present and equal. She had an echocardiogram, which I can't show you. We don't have it. We lost it because of a computer glitch. Basically, it was entirely normal, and you can see the base of the aorta very nicely, and that there was no dissection. And you can see the thoracic aorta with the aortic arch uh, by going into the jugular notch. And that was normal also. She had abdominal aortic ultrasound, no acute abnormality when compared with the previous and her potassium was low at 3.4. So the plan at that time was to find out, one, a little bit more about her uh, arrhythmia, which she cannot characterize for us. Uh, make sure she's okay, give her some potassium, because that certainly hypokalemia can, particip can um, precipitate arrhythmias. See her in the office and follow up. And she has a vascular surgeon that she's been seeing for routine ultrasound and MRIs every six months uh, because of following her dissection and following her aneurysm. She noted to have two bumps on her right arm associated with swelling and tenderness. I wasn't sure exactly what was going on. This is a, a follow-up on 6-2013. And it seemed like the, she might have had a, a couple little uh, clot areas there, or maybe little hematomas. She had a history of DVT, was on Coumadin. Also, she said her abdomen seemed to be have throbbing uh, where the aorta is, and she was concerned about seeing that. She was transferred to the hospital, Tampa General, for suspicion of worsening abdominal aortic dissection or right arm DVT, whichever. She got a 24-hour blood pressure monitor. She was pending a 30-day vent monitor for arrhythmias. Referred to hematology to check out on the Factor V Leiden, which tested negative this time. Factor V Leiden was negative. She's in the hospital. She, again, the physical exam, the pectus. CT of the abdomen showed a stable dissection of the inferenal abdominal aorta without aortic aneurysm. She does not have an aneurysm. And that was extending still into the right common iliac artery, artery, which appeared to be stable. And there was some mild ectasia or aneurysmal dilatation. All arteries were patent. And then the left renal cyst. And she had a CT of the chest, which we will show you. So here is her heart. Pulmonary artery is anterior. Here's the aorta. Doesn't look big relative to the pulmonary artery. It's a pretty decent study. Still got it. Some stuff we can trim off here a little bit to be able to see better. There we go. Take that off. There we go. That's better. Now we can see through this in the bottom part of the heart, so that's okay. So there's uh, her left anterior descending. Looks like a ramus or an OM. Trim this a little bit better. Some of this off of here so you can see better.
There we go. So here's the RCA coming down this way, coming down this way. I'm not sure if it continues on. This looks like uh, part of the circumflex here, so that's probably part of the probably start of part of the RCA, the PDA coming off. It's like a shared circulation. Let's take a look at the axial images. Well, what's obvious is the pectus extra bottom, and so that's fairly obvious. Most of the time, males want to get these fixed because they don't look very masculine with this big hole in their chest. But females don't mind it because it accentuates the breast. So they usually don't get them repaired. And now we can see the aorta. It doesn't look very big if we're worried about aortic problems. That's very small, 20.3. Not even any aortic ectasia. Let's take this back off. There we go. And let's scroll through here some more. Left atrial appendage, left atrium. So sometimes it gets sort of like a pancake heart. And you've got this deep cleft. And then the spine here. The left atrium is not big. I wouldn't think that would be supporting arrhythmias. Never documented her arrhythmias. I know there's a family history of atrial fibrillation. Her left ventricle looks fine. Everything's a little bit distorted by the pectus. Heart's kind of uh, horizontal across here. <laughs> Her cardium looks good. Let's go look in some other images where we can see things simultaneously. That's a nice looking aorta. Certainly doesn't fit with the rest of the picture. Over here and look. Yep. Let's see what we can see. There's the descending aorta, and it's not big either. So that looks good. I don't see any ectasia. You always have to be careful of dissection. And you always have to look carefully to make sure there's not a double lumen along here. Frequently missed on echo. I'm sorry I can't show the echo because it's the source of many lawsuits where someone comes in with chest pain and the echo has a very subtle tear on the aorta and wow. it's missed. The patient goes home and uh, doesn't get up doesn't get up in the morning. Yeah. And so then that becomes a frequent lawsuit and. Uh, Talking to a malpractice attorney, he had two of them from the same doctor. That's astounding. Third one's a charm. So, uh, got to be careful of that always. Let's look at the coronaries while we're hanging around. Again, the aorta is not very impressive. We don't see the arch. And usually uh, when we have a story like this, oh, here's the scoliosis. We have a story like this. We usually look at the arch, and we specify that they'll do a view of the arch. And so, proper instructions weren't given on this patient because it's so important that you want to see the whole thing. So let's take a look at some coronaries here. Over here, over here, didn't like that. There we go. You can see a little bit of this one. We don't expect 
to find coronary dissection, but we need to look, at least make sure that hasn't happened, because she is at risk of that, and we do see that. Not infrequently somebody shows up, but that's clearly not a dissected artery. And then we can go look at the right. And she doesn't have any calcification. Coronary origins appear to be normal. We can look at the cross section and get more cross sections. And then we can color code this. and magnify it and there we are so we don't see two lumens so this is a very good study to rule out dissection mm -hmm. and it's gated and with the gate you're not going to see something in motion that things in motion can have four walls, six walls, eight walls. And so you can look like dissection if something is moving through the plane that we're looking at. And so going back to this image, that if this wasn't gated, you might see several aortic walls. And uh, once a year, in many medical centers because they don't routinely gate the CT of the aorta they will see several walls because of the motion and operate on the patient and find out the patient doesn't have a dissection because they didn't gate the aorta that it looked like a dissection you definitely got to gate it because that's kind of tragic when you're inside there and there's nothing to be found. Mm. Close the chest and say, whoops, whoopsie. So it's, a, it's kind of tight in here, as you can see, with the pectus. It's kind of tight between the sternum and the spine, where we got to cram all this stuff in. So sometimes there's something called pancake heart syndrome where that might produce a murmur of this stuff all being so compartmentalized and so we're going to move on and so that was a good study that was what we wanted to know ah. so CT chest, no dissection or aneurysm of the thoracic aorta, no pericardial effusion or pleural effusion, left thyroid nodule, right arm, ultrasound Doppler, no evidence of thrombus, MRI of the brain, head, neck, no evidence of hemodynamically significant stenosis, dissection or aneurysm. So we, got, we did pretty good there. Vascular studies show patient is stable. Discharge with instructions to return if symptoms worsen. Follow up in office with cardiologist and vascular surgeon. So this is what we saw, right? Are there more images? Is that what you saw? That's what we saw. So basically someone who is in, at risk of having dissection, who already has dissection, who has aneurysmal aorta, or very interested in their blood pressure, most people never see one of these. This is a 24-hour blood pressure recording. And uh, you can see diastole and you can see systole. And you can see nighttime versus daytime. And I've seen a reversal of this. And it, uh, I said, boy, that's your puzzling. It turned out somebody was working the night shift. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't know that. And so you don't see these because there's not a lot of money to be made off of this. Now, nobody said that we're going to make a lot of money off of all of our tests. But this one, there's a low Medicare pay on it. 
And so, so nobody gets it and nobody has it. And it's impossible to do research on new blood pressure medicines without having a 24-hour blood pressure monitor, mm -hmm. as you know. And so it's equally impossible to take care of somebody with hypertension without a 24-hour blood pressure recording because how are you going to know if they're night dippers or not? And there are a lot of people who aren't night dippers. Their blood pressure doesn't go down at night. Or perhaps it's part of their hypertension and their medication isn't lasting long enough to get into the night. And so then you need to switch the medicines around. And you might be taking something HS or you might divide dose in a medication. Or you may be using a medication like HCTZ that uh, is only uh, less than 24 hours or low certain that's six hours. And so it's very possible. Lots of people use HCTZ and that certainly doesn't go 24 hours unless you get the new sustained release or unless you use chlorothalidone. And so without this you really can't manage blood pressure. So so we got this whether it's a Medicare loser or not and we can see that her blood pressure looks pretty reasonable. She's an, a pretty good night dipper as you can see and the daytime's not bad. So it looks like we don't have to worry about her blood pressure being too high. It's a little on the low side somewhat but certainly not too high. And so the patient 9-2014 had a new iliac dissection with severe bilateral leg pain, August 2014. I don't know if this is the same artery that dissected or if it's the other artery that dissected. She still was complaining of intermittent chest pain, shortness of breath, palpitations. She had a 30-day event monitor that showed some PAC, sinus tachycardia. She was taking albuterol for her asthma, so because of the sinus tachycardia, was switched to Zopinex which causes less elevation of the blood pressure and less tachycardia. In the interim, she was starting on Herbisartan and she had some multiple episodes of palpitation, chest pain, shortness of breath at rest, some episodes of abdominal pain, back pain, neck pain, headache, been to the ER on several occasions, no pulmonary emboli, no acute uh, events. She said several CTA and MRI imaging studies demonstrate straight, uh, that there's some stability, although she did have that more recent dissection of an iliac. And so she also was found to have a saccular splenic artery aneurysm, 10 millimeters. These are not unusual. We see these as artifacts, or we see this as sort of a serendipitous finding, not infrequently. We're just looking at a film and perhaps CTA and filling the splenic artery. We see that pretty commonly. Then moving on, she went to the hospital again. Episode of squeezing, substernal chest pain, shortness of breath, palpitations. Chest pain started one and a half hours ago and not subsided. She presented to Tampa General with a heart rate of 190. So she has some kind of arrhythmia. We're not sure what she has. She showed up with a heart rate of 190. She goes to Tampa General because that's where her surgeon is. So okay. he's watching her. And so that's why she goes there. But if you go to Tampa General, you will get a very thorough workup. And so without acknowledging that she's going to get a lot of x-rays in her lifetime, because of her problem and the surveillance is going to be MRI or CT. MRI, no radiation. CT, you can do low radiation. We're down to, if you do step and shoot, you could do uh, chest, about three millisieverts. Or you can get cardiac cath and angiography of everything, which is going to maybe go 15 millisieverts. And so these are our choices. And let's see what we have here. And I don't think we have one of the fellows to help us with our interpretation today. And so basically it looks like sinus tachycardia. 
there's a P wave and only one P wave. That looks like a pretty normal axis P wave that's matching every QRS. The axis is uh, almost 90 degrees. And uh, isoelectric here in lead one. There's some ST segment elevations over here in V1. That's not uncommon. But there are depressions in V5 and V6 that uh, this one is tending towards horizontality. But that's not reliable in females. And, uh, but still, you worry about dissection, always. We don't see any changes in an acute uh, ischemic cardiac event that would be dissection when you'd get ST segment elevation. So we don't see any of that. We don't see any pericarditis. And so I could see where people will always be worried when she comes in with chest pain. <laughs> it looks like whatever her arrhythmia was, it's gone. And so we don't have... She showed up with a heart rate of 190, but it looks like the heart rate of 190 has gone away now because her heart rate is about 105 or 110. So I hope they got a copy of her EKG when her heart rate was 190 because I'd like to know what her arrhythmia is. Well, let's move in here and see what we're going to do next. And uh, being in a cath center where cardiac cath is pretty readily available, Looks like she got a cardiac cath this time. I think I would have done a CT, but the CT, you'd have to slow down her heart rate, and maybe they were reluctant to do that. So uh, we'll take a beta blocker, but maybe she could use a beta blocker. I don't know what her blood pressure was. So let's take a look at her cardiac cath images. Okay, so we've got a coronary angiogram. Let me see about slowing that down a little bit. Here's our speed. There we go. Now you can see it more leisurely. Looks like we've got a uh, curved catheter that's deep throating the right coronary artery. And which is not uncommon. The catheter just sort of springs in. And uh, whoever's doing it doesn't want to pull it back out again because afraid they'll lose the osteum. So we're just going to go ahead with it deep throating and there's no probably no pressure drop. You can see it's not a sort of kinking where it is. There's sort of a kink. That's the catheter doing that. Frequently this produces catheter based spasm when it deep throats like that, but there's no problem here. And then you can see a lot of the right coronary artery and you can see the right coronary is a big coronary artery supplying a lot of branches out here. There's a whole bunch of them in the posterior lateral branches. And then here, the first branch is the posterior descending. So let's take a look at some more of these and see what they look like. And there's the left coronary artery. Serpenflex, LED, septal perforators. More of the left coronary artery. No coronary artery dissection. No dissection. We're going back up the left coronary artery. A couple more pictures. There's the uh, PA view. There's the deep throated right. They just left the catheter in and went ahead with the deep throat. And so it looks good in all those images. and then proceeded to inject other vessels. And uh, this is the injection of the abdominal aorta. Trying to look at the iliacs. There's a splenic artery looping over there. 
to your right. It looks like something. It's, it's less than optimal, of course. There's a splenic artery. That might. It's hard to tell what's going on. This. They're looking for a dissection. I'm not sure what we can see here. So it's not. Uh, it's so diluted, and she probably still has a fast heart rate. And so it's so diluted that you can't make anything out without a great deal of imagination. But it looks like the there's no obstruction to any of these vessels. Mm -hmm. to say that, and there's no big aneurysm in mm -hmm. the aorta, and the iliac on the right side seems to be a bit broad over there. That one's kind of broad, and so I can't. And there's a contrast being excreted by the kidney on the left side. And that's about all I can see from this. Let's go back to our slides. They were satisfied that they weren't dealing with a new process. They call that mild CAD. I'm not sure where the mild CAD was. A mild diffuse block with no obstruction. I didn't quite see that. Aortic arch is left-sided. That's looks looks like uh, the aortic arch. I don't. I didn't see the aortic arch. I guess that's when they were going up. Descending aorta is normal. The left subclavian to the iliacs and the renal arteries. All those things were grossly normal. Grossly normal. Certainly, that that's a good word to use. Yeah. Systemic hypertension with normal renal arteries, and I didn't, I saw some renal arteries go flashing by, and so let's move on and see what else we have to say. A patient was stabilized, discharged home, follow-up with cardiologists and vascular surgeons. What is her diagnosis? So that's what we need to find out. So any volunteers as to finding what is wrong with this lady? Well, let me try a really fundamental thing. God designed us with three layers, endoderm, mesoderm, ectoderm. This woman's got a mesenchymal problem in that the media of the vessel is uh, uh, allowing dissections. Uh, the two ideas that occurred to me are that I would be extremely interested in a full workup of her adrenal glands because at least half of the adrenal cells are of mesenchymal origin and I think there's something wrong in her mesenchymal cells and uh, these episodes of tachycardia uh, may well have a non-cardiac initiation. End of statement. Okay, we will show you a case like that one day. That would okay. be a surprise for you and a present. Good. And so, very interestingly described. If this patient were seven foot tall and had a pectus and had scoliosis, and had dissections and uh, aneurysms. Would that be called Marfan? You wouldn't. You wouldn't hesitate to throw in your hat and say Marfan's. But she's five foot seven rather than seven foot five, if we're correct. And so then she has something that's like Marfan's, very much so. Uh, and was described by Hal Dietz and someone else. And Hal Dietz is at Hopkins and replaced, uh, he has actually Dr. Victor McCuthick's seat. There's a chair that's endowed for genetics and he has mm -hmm. that chair. And so, and he's the one who figured this out. And if you're so wonderful as to figure out some, a new syndrome, then you're, you're honored by putting your name on it, humbly as that could be. 
And so let's look at what his name is, never to be forgotten at our conference. And so there's a guy by the name of Lois, and uh, he's a researcher, I think somewhere in Europe, who simultaneously stumbled on the same thing. And then there's Hal Deeks. So we got this interesting combination. And so how you pronounce it is found out by going online and hearing Dr. Dietz talk about this syndrome. And so he looks like everybody's calling it like Lois, L-O-I-S, but it's more like Lois, L-O-E-S. And so they're calling it Lois Dietz syndrome. And uh, that's, that's the story. Now how you pronounce things like that is kind of interesting. There's something called Lutam Bache syndrome that I learned when I was in med school. And uh, there was a conference I went to, and Lutam Bache syndrome was being described by someone at the podium, and it's mitral stenosis and an atrial septal defect. And uh, when we got to the questioning part uh, about Lutam Bache syndrome, there was a hand that went up in the back, and a mic was handed to this gentleman, and the gentleman said, my name is Lutenbacher, not Le Tombache. I am German, <laughs> not French. And so, so much for Le Tombache syndrome. And so, there's a very stern-looking gentleman, is Hal Dietz. He's had better days, I think. And uh, you can see in the background some DNA that's... Uh, <laughs> I looked to find this image. I couldn't find it again. I've seen it before. Uh, and I was looking for actually the DNA identification of what's being produced where on the DNA. and couldn't find that. But he is legitimately an internist and a geneticist. And he went after this like a bulldog. And uh, this is some stuff that's going on that's very important. And uh, TGF beta is the unifying theory, and there's a TGF beta 1 and 2, these are very much responsible for multi-system abnormalities. And you can have either something wrong with TGF beta 1, beta 2, or beta receptor 1 and 2, and here's the beta receptor 1 and 2, or some things that are involved in the same chain, such as SMOD 2 and 3, SMOD 6 and 7. SMOD 4, and uh, so forth. There's SMOD 1, 5, and 8. And so all of this stuff seems to be involved, and there's also some involvement with the angiotensin receptors. And so this is very complicated stuff, and you can number them, and the numbers will tell you which abnormality is morphine, which abnormality is Lowell's Dietz, and which one is another? There's another one they've found since then, a third aortography, aor aortopathy. There's a third that's been found. And so here's the legend for this. And one is Marfan, so let's go to one. One seemed to involve the fibrillin 1. So TGF beta 1 to fibrillin 1 seems to be the problem there. Well, that's very interesting because Dr. Dietz was able to produce some knockoff mice that uh, were Marfan mice, and uh, they had fibrillin 1 error and TGF beta 1 error, and uh, he was able to show that if you had a group of them and you put them on Indorol, there was delay to developing aneurysms. But if you put them on low sartan, there was no development of aneurysms. Wow. So was, yeah, so that's a, it turns out that a very cheap drug, low sartan, is a TGF beta 1 blocker. Very cheap drug. And so that's amazing. So then yes. he was able to protect the mice from getting Marfan, sort of ruin their basketball careers, but protect them from getting Marfans. And then... Wow. He was able to do this with children and babies. And so it's preventive, and it prevents not only the things that are happening in the aortopathy area, but also things that are happening 
with calcium and calumodulum and actin and things that are happening in skeletal formations. And so that's a very protective thing, a great discovery. And that's why this lady is on Losartan, and that's why she was started on an ARB-type drug. Brilliant. Let's go back over here, and we'll see Lowe's Dietz is number two. And there's number two. Now, there are several Lowe's Dietz. And this is type one, two, and then three. Lowe's Dietz type three, four. OK, is three. And there's three. Smod two, three. And then we've got uh, low deeds type four, which is number four, appropriately. Low deeds type four. And up here. And then we come over and we find there's a Schripsen, the Goldberg syndrome, which is mm -hmm. number five. And that's a new addition to aortopathy, which is number five. Number five, there we go. And then there's a cutis laxotype, and there's an arterial tartarosity, and familial thoracic aortic aneurysms and dissections. Now, whether these will respond to uh, an angiotensin receptor blocker, I don't know. But I basically, after this experience, I had patients with aortic aneurysms on beta blockers to prevent the rate of rise of DPDT. I not only did that, but I also added Losartan as a drug for their hypertension, because invariably there's some hypertension. And then we've got our friend Ehlers Danlos coming, uh, coming into this. And so there we go on the collagen changes, elastin yes. changes, changes in skeleton, and so forth. And so Lowe's Dietz was first described in 2005, so it's of the very modern era, 11 years ago, autosomal dominant, so that means you've got to watch the kids and you've got to test the kids. Connective tissue disorder caused by mutations in a couple different genes that have to do with TGF beta receptor 1, TGF beta receptor 2, or TGF growth factor 1 or 2, causing 1 or 2 Lowe's Dietz and going on to cause other Lowe's Dietz syndromes. And so first described autosomal dominance, which you need to remember, which means check the kids. And uh, whether they need to be on an ARB or not you know, would be up to Dr. Dietz. And since Dr. Dietz is still alive and very active at Johns Hopkins, I had the pleasure of sending this lady to Dr. Dietz. I said, if you have Perfect. Dietz syndrome, you might as well go see Dr. Dietz. So we called him up. And she went over there. So there are four types of gene mutations that produce Dietz 1, 2, 3, and 4. The findings get cranial synostosis, where the cranial sutures form and solidify early. You get wide-placed eyes, hypertellurism, bifid uvula, uvula, bifid uvula. Some, like, some things that are kind of like morphins and some things that are not like morphins. You know, certainly the scoliosis she has, pectus excavatum she has. She doesn't have club feet. She hasn't any organ rupture. She does have some bruising. And the skin is somewhat translucent, where you can see veins more prominently than you could otherwise. And here's the bifid uvula there I'll and be. there. And so that's pretty amazing. I haven't looked to see if she has that. We'll have to look. Wow. Aortic root aneurysms are present in 98%. So she hasn't gotten that yet. But we've got to be very careful. And we've got to search every echo very carefully because of it being frequently missed and resulting in lawsuits. I believe that this woman should not have echoes. I believe she ought to have uh, time in the MRI machine with a much higher resolution and a lower miss rate. And it will give us a lot more information. And we won't have yes. the problem with being sued for missing it on an echo. Yes. So, arterial tortuosity, cerebral hemorrhage, lots of things to look for. Most common spinal abnormality is scoliosis. Well, she's got that. Pectus disformities, and she has that. 
dual ecta dual ectasia. Lots of interesting things that I haven't seen on her. And then surgical guidelines, you know, looking at the aortic annulus and measuring it. Children, progression, rapid expansion if that's occurring. You want to be on that. Adults, aortic root dissections, aortic root dimension greater than four. That's, uh, that's unusual because uh, in other diseases, which are more slow in their development, we, we set our target higher at 5.5 and 6. And so you have to change. and You have to look for a smaller aorta to be aggressive about. And Duke Cameron is the guy that works with Hal Dietz. And Duke Cameron, because Hal Dietz is there, is an expert at Lois Dietz as well as Morphan's Repair and has mm -hmm. the biggest clinic in the country at Hopkins. Mm -hmm. And so, so then there's some other things that are personal decision making, personal decision making based on other arteries. And so the testing, well, there's a genetic test. And so actually it's like a sort of aortopathy test that will give you low deeds Lowe's Dietz and Marfan's identification at the same time. And so this is how you prepare it, how you order it, and uh, the turnaround time is eight to nine weeks, and they need two, two to five milliliters of blood, lavender top tubes, oral rinse, buckle brushes. So there's some ideas. And then complex rather than simple starches, moderate physical activity, avoid competitive and contact sports. And so we have had more fans because they're so tall playing basketball and rupturing on the court. Mm -hmm. so that's a contraindication. Blood pressure control, beta blockers and ARBs now, serial monitoring of dissection, uh, echo valve function, aortic dimensions, well, as Bob said, that's fraught with error. Questions? And so, well, the one other thing that occurred to me as an anesthesiologist, when I see somebody who's got a real high heart rate, I'm wondering how good their venous return is. And this person whose heart is constrained by uh, the adjacent anatomy, uh, one of my questions is adequacy of venous return as a trigger for the compensatory uh, tachycardia. And so that's interesting. I think the tachycardia is a bona fide arrhythmia. And so she just doesn't have an alive core. A live core is the adapter you put on your phone and uh, basically makes it capable, makes you capable of actually recording a rhythm strip and then transmitting it to your physician if he gives you an email address. And so, so you I, will educate her. <laughs> so actually I gave out my email address and I gave my iPhone to somebody yesterday. Good. I gave good news. And so I think it's important that anybody in your practice get it, make sure that they have a phone and then they have one of these, a live core or live ECG uh, attachments that you put on for monitoring and then also that they get uh, a download the app and then that makes them less attached to the emergency room and they don't have to keep running to the emergency room when they get a tachycardia which can be a problem because once you show up in the emergency room you might be getting a lot of treatment and there may be yeah. treatment that you don't need and there are people that don't know you and there are people that uh, hanging around looking for somebody to operate on. So, <laughs> so, yeah. so that's for their job. They're being paid to be there. It's kind of boring right. to hang around. And so here you can see what's called the pancake heart. We've seen atrial septal defects with pancake hearts. And so, but I doubt that if a problem, she's had two pregnancies, they get hypervolemic with pregnancy. Yeah, she didn't have any problems with her pregnancies, so I doubt that's what's happening here. It seems Fair like enough. her heart has moved over to the right and is occupying the right chest instead of being uh -huh. midline. 
And so nature has a way of accommodating things. And then you can see Superior Vena Cava up here, which got all the contrast in it. It looks like fair size. And then we get down, we can't really see much of the inferior vena cava, just a little bit of contrast spilling down into it. And so, but a good thought, and certainly there have been some thoughts entertained about the pancake heart and the ability to be able to get a good cardiac output. But this heart was smart enough to move over to the right. And so there she is. And so we will keep in touch with this lady and uh, we'll get you a further follow-up because you know her life's going to be an adventure. But the main point is that she's now 33 years old. She's had two kids. Probably one of her kids will have this. She's been under great surveillance. The average lifespan is 26 years of age. We've got a new discovery, which is an ARB drug that may be very appropriate. So things are changing and changing very positively. We even know what's wrong genetically and as we're doing with sickle cell disease there's always an opportunity to plug in a new gene and use CRISPR Cas9 technology which has been a home run in terms of snipping bits of genes and putting new ones in. So CRISPR C-R-I-S-P-R Cas C A S nine is the new scissors for readily uh, taking out pieces of genes and inserting new pieces, and so that's revolutionized uh, genetics. And I'm sure we'll be hearing from Hal Dietz about that. In okay, the let me near uh, let me just float a question. Uh, I'm aware that. Uh, transplants of lymphocytes can be immensely powerful, especially if you're dealing with, say, lymphocytes from a adolescent to, uh, say, 15, 18-year-old, whatever. They make armies out of 18-year-olds and 15-year-olds, so their blood is not that hard to get. I am extremely curious about how much we might be able to do for this lady by providing an exquisitely well-mashed HLA basis uh, lymphocyte slash stem cell, because the stem cells are mixed in with the lymphocytes, uh, transfusion. And that's, that's beyond my capability, but I was going to show you and it sounds like a very interesting idea that uh, we'll have to see what Dietz is doing over there. Look at this. We've got a left atrium that's somewhat squashed. And so I've never seen a left atrium that's 18 by 72. And Amazing. So squashed left atrium that's trying to accommodate where it's supposed to be and, uh, and how much it's supposed to be able to fill the volume. It would be interesting to have a nice cardiac MRI study and uh, that's what we'll have to do to get a good baseline on her and get further information. And so that would be very useful in following her. And also, another point, in terms of radiation exposure, when she has these CT scans, she does not have to have maximal radiation exposure. We can actually gate the whole thing like we're doing a cardiac study and do step and shoot and I dose and reduce the radiation just like we do with our coronary CTs to three millisieverts and get the same information on the abdomen, the thoracic aorta, and the iliacs that we were getting for 30 millisieverts of radiation. And so, so I yeah, showed I'm, her to come here from now on because we'll tailor the radiation to what's going on with her and we can keep her from getting a very high cumulative dose to her breast. Exactly. Exactly, exactly. So thank you very much. I, I'm, I'm glad you had an opportunity to see this very rare case. I was wonderful, amazed. Wonderful I was case. The room and we look forward to seeing you next week. Thank Super you for better. bringing us Bob. these awesome say, patients. Yeah, Shannon, Mindy, we'll see you guys later. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.